Good afternoon and good evening for those joining us from abroad. Um, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Maya Kadar Kowalski, and I'm a board member of the American Friends of Tel Aviv University. I'm a second generation governor of Tel Aviv University and a very proud alumnus of the university. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar called the PTSD fallout from the war with Hamas, featuring Professor Yair Bar Chaim, the director of the National Center for Traumatic Stress and Resilience at Tel Aviv University, who is also a professor of psychology and neuroscience at the university. Professor Bar Chaim is a world-renowned expert on PTSD who regularly works with the IDF on health programs to help soldiers and military personnel, especially those with PTSD and trauma. His research focuses on emotional, cognitive, neural, and genetic mechanisms underlying anxiety and mood disorders. His primary focus is translating science into effective therapies and prevention programs for these, disorder, for these disorders, as well as other stress-related disorders, including PTSD. Professor Bar Chaim has developed a computerized intervention program designed to mitigate PTSD in soldiers, as well as to help children and adults with trauma. Currently, every IDF soldier uses Professor Bar Chaim's computer program at the beginning of their training in hopes of mitigating PTSD. Additionally, more than 200 clinical and research sites globally use Professor Bar Chaim's computer. Oh, computer protocol, excuse me, including the United States Army and the Australian Defense Force. Following Professor Bar Chaim's briefing, we will take questions from the audience. Please write them in the chat box and we will try to get to as many as possible. It is my pleasure to turn the program over to Professor Yair Bar Chaim. Professor, welcome. Thank you. And thank you for the kind introduction and also for the people who took the time to uh, to meet with us. Um, we are in the midst of a very difficult period here in Israel. Um, I will try to explain from the mental health perspective what we are facing. Um, and then I will say a few words about PTSD and explain what it means. And then uh, we'll describe some of the response that uh, Tel Aviv University um, is mounting for this. Um, so following October 7, after a few days when the uh, situation became, uh, the magnitude of the uh, trauma and the situation became clearer, we started um, assessing what would be the need following the immediate period after uh, uh, what happened. And when I'm saying following, I mean we are still in the midst of it. Uh, the civilian population and the military operants who were on the ground fighting those first days, um, they are receiving uh, emergency treatment at the moment. The ground operation just started a couple of days ago, and we already know that it will have it already has casualties on our side, um, and will produce more PTSD cases. Uh, and it depends how long it takes. Um, a conservative. Uh, assessment at the moment is that we will be facing a wave of about 30,000 new cases of PTSD um, in a matter of a couple of months. Now, this number is difficult to understand in terms of uh, how many people will need professional help. And I'm not talking now about the acute stress response that many people uh, have at the moment and mental health professionals basically volunteered uh, a lot of their time to uh, handle. I'm talking about 30,000 new cases that, that will reflect chronic disorder. 
And this number is so large that the current system is simply unable to absorb. Uh, just to give you a, a sense of it, before the war, both the public and the private sectors were already in insufficiency and waiting lists were anywhere between six and nine months in both systems. And now um, we are looking for solutions, uh, but you have to understand that this is a tidal wave that will be very difficult to handle. Um, so that's on that. Uh, I want to explain for a second what PTSD is and what are the symptoms that are related to it so that you will have a, an idea of uh, what I'm talking about. PTSD is a very difficult disorder to treat and it's a very difficult disorder to live with. And it has a, a large impact of course on the patient, but also on their uh, immediate circle, children, family, uh, uh, co-workers, uh, if they are able to maintain a job. There are four types of uh, clusters of symptoms that uh, characterize PTSD. The first one is reliving and re-experiencing re the trauma as if it is happening now. This is a very frightening uh, symptom and it can be, uh, it can happen during wakeful hours, but also during sleep in nightmares of the trauma recurring um, uh, during sleep. Uh, this is the first set of symptoms and it affects people very strongly. Uh, they can experience this, uh, these symptoms uh, out of nowhere, out of the blue, during driving or just sitting down at home, uh, it's very frightening. The other set of symptoms is hyperarousal, uh, being on the edge all the time, um, every little noise uh, startles, um, and, uh, and that's the other cluster of symptoms. Then we have a cluster of symptoms that is of avoidance. Avoidance of anything that remind the patient of the trauma. Now, avoidance is a very severe symptom because it may start with some uh, thought avoidance, but very quickly it becomes, um, it looks like people uh, refrain from going out of their house, going out of home because they are afraid that uh, some trigger will uh, cause the flashbacks and the uh, tense feelings and the anxiety. And this affects very uh, strongly the daily functioning of people with PTSD. And finally, the last cluster is a cluster of um, alterations of how people perceive the world. Uh, we usually think of the world as a safe place or relatively safe. Um, People who experienced extreme trauma and developed PTSD many, time, many times cannot go back to the older schemas um, and uh, see the world as a very dangerous place. Um, they are many times depressed, uh, have suicidal ideation, and uh, have a whole cluster of uh, negative thoughts and uh, emotions about the world. Uh, and the self. Uh, so PTSD taken together, PTSD is a very complex and multi-symptom um, disorder. This is what we are facing. We are seeing the first phases of it, but usually in the uh, psychological and psychiatric world, PTSD is not diagnosed within the first two to three months following the trauma. Why? Because usually, People respond with these symptoms following trauma. About 70% of people or even 80% of the people who experience severe trauma experience these symptoms, but they reside as time go, goes on. And most of the people, about 90% of the people 
will be able to recuperate without specific treatment or uh, will recuperate uh, after a few weeks or a couple of months. So when I say 30,000 is an underestimation of what we will see, um, but these will be uh, people that after three months, um, their symptoms do not reside. Uh, now, maybe I will move on to try to explain what we are trying to do because I'm really sorry to say this, but it's very difficult for the government, for the state to respond uh, on many levels. And mental health is one of these levels. Um, the existing, the extant system is simply not geared to uh, address and deal with this large quantity of new patients. Um, in response to this, and I have to say it's a partial response only, but a serious one. Uh, Tel Aviv University um, was gearing up to open its National Center for Traumatic Stress and Resilience in a couple of years. And it was, we were preparing to open it in a new building that is currently uh, being built. Uh, it's supposed to be, a, I think, uh, five or six floors um, building dedicated to uh, studying uh, post-traumatic stress and resilience and also to have a clinic within it. But the building is not ready uh, and will not be ready for another year and a half. And we understood that we will have to open our clinic um, right now. When I say right now, we're going to open the largest clinic in Israel uh, dealing with PTSD. It will open its gates for the public um, in January 1st. It's a very quick time to set up. And this clinic um, is uh, backed up by uh, Tao's officials. We received a space, a building, to uh, a temper for a temporary residence for this clinic. We are hiring a team of the best uh, and most experienced uh, therapists, social workers, psychiatrists, and psychologists uh, who specialize in PTSD and trauma to come and work with us. Um, we already uh, got uh, not interest, but commitment from uh, about 10 people uh, who will come to work with us. You have to understand these are people who shut down their own private clinic to come and work with us. That's one pillar of the clinic that we are building. The other pillar of therapists is the core of clinical faculty members um, who are either clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, or social workers who actually have experience in treatment um, of both adults and children. Um, currently, we are 10 faculty members from uh, different departments, uh, different schools at Tel Aviv University. Uh, that are committed to uh, provide both leadership and direct uh, treatment to patients uh, within the new clinic. We also have a large uh, body of uh, professionals in training, younger people who are in training, who committed to volunteer in exchange for supervision and uh, learning. And finally, uh, there will be computerized treatments uh, used in the center. We will apply a stepped care approach to treatment because of the large numbers. Uh, we will start with a, a light touch treatment that we can provide to a large quantity of patients. But for those who will not respond or will not respond enough, uh, they will st step up 
to the next level, which will be group therapy, uh, trauma-focused group therapy of various types, and then to uh, individual treatment. Uh, and also here we have uh, various uh, expertise, but in general, all the protocols that we will use will be evidence-supported protocols. Um, we have a large network of uh, professionals from Israel and also from around the globe who uh, volunteered to uh, do the training for our staff, um, which will take place uh, in the month of uh, December. Um, we intend to treat between 1,000 and 4,000 people in the first year uh, of the clinic, starting January 1st. It's not a, a full answer uh, to the problem, but it's something. It's the biggest and uh, most professional clinic uh, to work on this in Israel. And what, from my talks with the Ministry of uh, Health, uh, where I sit on the on the committee there that try, is trying to decide what to do, is that if our model um, appears uh, powerful and uh, works well, we will try to replicate it um, in uh, two or three more places um, and see uh, see if we can handle the situation better. Um, the catchment area for the clinic, uh, the geographical catchment area, um, consists of about 4.5 to 5 million people. It's uh, people who are residing between, uh, let's say, uh, Kfar Saba, Ranana, in the north and maybe Ashdod in the south. Um, it is estimated that about two thirds of the new cases of PTSD will come from this catchment area. So about 20,000 new cases, even more um, because it's a conservative uh, estimation. And um, and yes, so this is our plan. Uh, I just have to say one more thing. The people who were attacked near the Gaza area, uh, near the Gaza Strip, they are no longer living there. And about two thirds of them also live in the catchment area of the clinic and will uh, receive direct, uh, could receive direct treatment from us. Um, we're going to actively uh, uh, look for certain populations to deal with. Uh, one of the uh, popu uh, special populations that we were asked to prepare to treat is uh, rescued uh, hostages. So I think... Um, I don't have much more to say at this point, but I want to hear your questions. Uh, we're dealing with a serious problem. I'm sure there are many other areas uh, in Israel that are uh, facing very serious difficulties, but the mental health uh, system is gonna to have to work extremely hard under very difficult conditions uh, to produce some kind of a response to the situation. So I really um, look forward to hearing your questions and answering all the questions you have. Um, maybe I should stop here, okay? Okay. Well, thank you, Yair, for, for first of all, for being here and for the, the initial overview. So there's a lot to cover. So um, um, I, wanna, I wanna just start. Um, there have been some uh, submissions to the question and answer. So let's go with, first of all, we have a bunch of people who are wondering, can we can we propose our help for foreign language like French for the French um, speaking population or um, somebody else says that they conduct therapy in English, Hebrew, Russian and Ukrainian. Um, would they be able to 
I see that there's lots of people who want to submit their resumes, essentially. So um, what's your response to that? I, I have uh, first, my response is I'm grateful. And I'm th I thank you. Um, you could um, uh, pass your interest either directly to me or through uh, Maya and the team, the team that works in the background of this. Um, we are uh, aware that uh, we may need uh, uh, foreign languages uh, uh, for treatment within our clinic. Uh, we are already recruiting some people uh, who can give it in Russian and Ukrainian. Um, English is easier for us, but uh, uh, French we don't have yet. <laughs> um, and um, look, we are setting up a very um, powerful and complex system in a very short time. And we are trying to get all the help that uh, people offer to us. Um, we will have to see how we handle this. So um, I guess on case-to-case -case basis, um, uh, we will develop models to uh, to receive all the help we can get. And I, I have ask, to, um, let, uh, let me is there a, one, go ahead. One, let me just explain one more thing. When I say we will try to treat anywhere between 1,000 and 4,000 people, it really depends on how well we get organized uh, to do that. We will surely treat 1,000 with what we have at the moment. Um, and you know, I I already know that we will open our doors January 1st and February 1st will be full. So, yeah. I, I just wanted uh, to clarify if you are have, if there are plans for an online component of the treatment so that people can understand if they can, can um, contribute in that way. Okay, so the first line of preparation is not online, is uh, physical. We are already preparing our models for online treatment, um, and uh, but we're not there yet. But indeed, if there are people abroad, the, the one of the problems is to, when you have this kind of uh, large scale clinic, is to have a systemized uh, way of doing things. And it's not very easy to plug in uh, people and see what, what, uh, how they can contribute. But I can tell you that I will look into every case and I will respond to every uh, person who contacts me and one uh, who's a therapist and wants to uh, get involved. And if we can set it up, uh, I will certainly be grateful for any kind of help. So let me let me um, move on to the next question, which um, is also coming at me from some various people. So I want to try to um, uh, contextualize it. But we spoke about um, the difference, of course, between PTSD and then trauma, which is um, what I think every Israeli and frankly, many Jews around the world are facing. And some people here in the chat are even saying that their therapists and even their non-Jewish patients are experiencing um a bit of trauma. Um, so I just want to know um, what, you know, what, what can we sort of do about this general trauma and will we, um, I actually don't know what, what the question is beyond that, but but how, how, how can we sort of be there to help each other um, uh, in this time? Well, I, I, I can say a few things about this. First, trauma is a very broad uh, term. And um, we use it, we use it uh, quite uh, frequently, but we sometimes mean slightly different things. Uh, I, I believe, I think, uh, most people uh, who are related to Israel or know Israeli people uh, around the world are shocked with uh, the atrocities that we were uh, facing. Okay, um, and uh, are uh, really shocked and traumatized and concerned 
and also maybe from their reactions uh, around the globe from uh, other groups who support uh, Gaza or support the Hamas. Uh, this is uh, certainly uh, uh, difficult. Um, then you have uh, milder, sl sl slightly more uh, severe trauma of, let's say, people who get rocket fired, rockets fired on them, but they're not directly there. Uh, so they, it is traumatizing. The, you know, it's not easy to take your kids or take yourself and run to the shelter and hear the booms around you. Um, um, so I hope we don't get a run uh, while, while we are online, but it's highly probable. Uh, I live a bit towards the so south of Tel Aviv, and we get it all the time. Uh, so this is another level. But then there is another level to it, is the people who were directly exposed to the atrocities and survived them. And this kind of trauma is at a different level and can produce more, typically produces more symptoms. So when you ask me what you can do, first I would pay attention to the... Uh, to, to your feelings, to your uh, behavior. If you start seeing uh, avoidance or, or <clears throat> social situations, if you start seeing um, up too strong an apprehension or not, uh, not connecting to people you usually connect to, that's a good point to... Uh, uh, confront this with yourself or maybe uh, get some help or try to be together. This is really helpful. And there are also things you can do to, uh, to help us. Um, can you hear the booms in the background now? We don't hear no. it by the magic of Zoom, but I believe yeah. you. Yeah. Do you need to go? Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. If I'll have to go, I'll tell you. Yeah, uh, but uh, what you can do for us uh, is simple. I've received thousands of emails from people I know who just say, uh, hey, I've been thinking of you. You know, I, I have contacts with many people. Sometimes I'm the only Israeli they know. Uh, but I have friends. Uh, so my close friends around the globe, we email, talk all the time. But uh, many people just, you know, I met them once in a conference or uh, something. They drop in a note and they say, hey, I've been thinking about you. I'm, I hope you're okay. And I was surprised. I usually quite cynical uh, person, but I was surprised that I felt good by this. So if you drop a note to the people you know, and they don't actually have to be um, uh, they don't actually have to be in Israel they could be in your community uh, but I, from my personal experience this really helps and it means a lot I, I concur I feel the same I've, I've gotten some outreach and I think it's very meaningful and I also hear that um, this is more anecdotal but that volunteering that a lot of Israelis have gone out and are finding themselves volunteering and giving of themselves because it's their way of coping, I think. Um, so uh, I completely agree. Uh, and it's actually uh, uh, heartwarming to see how, how much people want to uh, be part of the community and support. Um, I personally had didn't have time to breathe. Uh, so I don't know. I was I was called up the first day after the war started, um, and now I was released back home. But now that the ground operation started, they tell me I might have to go back, and um, and every minute that I have, uh, and sometimes I have chunks of time to to do things, and uh, in the evenings I work on this clinic, and this clinic. Uh, is going to open January 1st. 
and we need all the help we can get to do this. Uh, I, I have to say, this is probably the only chance we're going to have to respond seriously to the mental health crisis. Um, and if and it's us, it's our time now. If we don't do it, it's not going to happen. So we're going to do it. We're gonna, we're just going to do it. So um, let's see. I'm like trying to figure out where what else I can ask you. I want to I want to hear a little bit more about so your specific work with PTSD. Somebody is asking, and I think that that's important. Could you tell us a little bit about these protocols that you've set in place? Is there is there you know is it something that you think is understandable to lay? observers yeah. yeah so uh, i'll explain we have two lines of work that are now or maybe three lines of work that become uh very uh useful at this moment uh, one line is prevention uh prevention of ptsd in uh, combat bound soldiers is something we've been studying for the past more than 15 years um and we developed uh applications that were adopted by the IDF um, and were per perfected and um, streamlined. And once the war had started, it took us uh, a very short time to bring them to uh, actual uh, distribution. And we need to distribute to, uh, I'm not gonna give exact numbers, but, uh, let's say more than 100,000 people, north of 100,000. Uh, we're not there yet, but uh, we are in the tens of thousands. Um, and um, that's part of what I'm working on with the IDF. Um, we need to talk to commanders, we need to explain to them what they're doing, and then, then they have to deliver uh, to their soldiers. This is an application that attunes the uh, attention system to be more vigilant to potential threats in the environment. Mm -hmm. um, we've done tens of studies on this system, uh, the neural system that supports it and the behavioral uh, factors that uh, go into it. We've done this work in close collaboration with the National Institutes of Health uh, my best buddy, Daniel Pine, uh, there, who's the branch chief there and supported us for many years, and with the um, uh, Department of Defense and the Walter Reed Institute for Army Research um, in Washington, who funded most of these studies. Um, so on this front, it's uh, quite rare that, you know, you do a lot of work it's the evidence is there it's ready and then people need it and then you can give it to them so it's it's quite a uh, quite a rare situation in science but um, it's actually happening um and um you and, know and what's preventing it from being widely deployed if if there is there any thing that's getting in the way or is it uh no, no. If you are, uh, let's say, uh, an infantry uh, platoon uh, sitting in Gaza and you didn't do it before you entered, and now we want to give it to you, they don't have the smartphones with them. They have to go back. So when they get out for ref to reload and refresh themselves, then we have to find several minutes to actually do it. It's logistics. Okay. Uh, log logistics is hard. Um, it's not my responsibility. My responsibility is uh, is the the science and the functional clinical of part of it. Uh, but I also uh, make sure that my kids' units get it and that my old unit gets it. And so we can we do everything we can. And so that's one thing: prevention. The other thing is. Um, Using similar cognitive bias modification programs that are computerized to treat PTSD. Um, in fact, this part of the equation, the treatment part, is uh, much better research 
researched and the evidence base is larger and it shows um, uh, small to medium effect sizes in clinical work. So it's very light touch, but all, but significant. And what we found now, you know, if you have to compare it to other first line treatments like cognitive behavior therapy or group focus group therapy, maybe, uh, maybe it's similar or maybe it's a bit less potent. But when you face such large numbers, it became clear that it's a very powerful, useful tool. And what happens is not only that we are going to use it as a first line treatment within our clinic, but we also created a website through which uh, professionals can get, professionals and other clinics can get trained and receive the software to deliver the treatment. Um, we've already uh, been contacted by uh, several of the largest other clinics in Israel. And so we support them and we provide this treatment uh, to them uh, with guidance. Um, so that's, uh, so these are the three lines, prevention, application within the clinic and dissemination to other professionals and clinics uh, to provide them another another tool in their toolkit or toolbox to, to deal with the situation. I hope that we can share possibly on the chat maybe what that website is, if that's if that's uh, okay. Because um, I think there seem to be a lot of professionals on this chat, to be honest, uh, from some of the questions that we're getting. Um, so uh, as far as the way, you know, we do have a lot of people that, that need treatment right away. Is there any way that you are um, you know, uh, highlighting different segments of the population? And is there any way that you are um, sort of filtering, um, you know, yes. and, and especially in these emergency clinic, in the emergency clinic that you're setting up? Um, by the way, for those who are, I'm going to do a quick little plug also for the Tel Aviv University Emergency Fund, which is uh, collecting, uh, of course, funds that will directly um, be put to use within uh, these emergency clinics. So you should know that if you're donating there, this is uh, part of where uh, this this money is going. But but please tell us how are how are you going about um, um, you know figuring out who who is the most needy? I guess. So, well, I'll answer in two ways. First, there's an intake process. You know, people could approach us and uh, we will treat them. Uh, there will be an intake process that will determine the severity of the disorder and uh, the, the clinical decisions on, on what type of treatment uh, would be best for them. Um, that's like, that's open to everyone, but we are also, once the key players uh, that are supposed to treat large populations of uh, PTSD, uh, which is the Ministry of uh, Defense in Israel, um, the IDF and the uh, social services, uh, the National Social Services. Um, uh, they already contacted us. And um, uh, of course, they are interested in sending to us older patients. and But we will have to find the mechanism to take the more severe cases and the cases that um, are more, most appropriate to our uh, clinic. Um, uh, so we had a lot of thinking about this because even if we don't communicate with anyone, the clinic will be full very quickly. Um, but we are trying to do this and we are saving some place for the hostages uh, who, who hopefully we will have some released um, uh, so that we could uh, uh, handle their treatment. Uh, we've been asked specifically to do this. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I can't even imagine how you prepare for something like that, but I'm hoping that you will have many to treat that we will have them out. Um, so I can, tell, I can tell in that respect, I can tell you that we hired the most professional person who treated Gilad Shalit 
and developed all the protocols for this. Uh, he's on our our payroll. So Amazing. that's our preparation, first preparation. So somebody here is asking, and I think this is a, I mean, this is a little bit like the, the question I asked you before, but somebody who's not necessarily a therapist, but a doctor, a medical doctor is asking, how can I take care, care of patients um, who are collateral victims, like that are just watching the TV and the social media and are, um, and uh, are are taking it in. Is there is there any advice that we can give um, uh, you know medical doctors to uh, to give their patients? The social media is just horrible, um, and the TV is uh, not as horrible, but it's also horrible. People get sucked into it, and they spend hours and they see difficult things, especially on social media. Um, I have an advice, but it's not very practical, is to try to reduce the use and to limit um, to limit the time that, or even the content that uh, people are uh, watching, especially for uh, children and adolescents, if possible. Uh, I know that it's very powerful, it's very hard to restrict, but it's harmful. Um, some of the uh, films released by Hamas, um, I would advise not to watch them if you can. Um, I looked and I regret it. Yeah. I I actually um, also, when I see something coming, I, I literally have to look away and I tell my kids too. I said, I, I throw away the phone. <laughs> You know, I'm being if, I'm being a little dramatic, but I, I I think that it's so harmful. You literally, you know, you can't unsee it, right? So it's and it's it's very um, difficult. Somebody is asking here, and I actually think I want to hear more about this. Do you need additional funds, and if so, for what purposes? We need funds. It is quite expensive to uh, to mount that operation in such a quick. Uh, response. Um, we need a lot of funds. And um, basically, you have to understand the the more funds we get, the bigger the clinic, the more people treated. So we are preparing for a minimum uh, in my unit uh, in the army when I was young, you know, there is a definition of a minimum mission and maximum mission. So you go on a mission, there's a minimum you have to perform for the mission to be uh, justified. The minimum mission is a thousand patients in the first year. I mean, that's a number I came up with and we're going to stand to our work. But we want to reach 4,000. That's four times more. So funding is the key here because people line up to join us. And I have to tell you, these 10 people that are already committed for a, a, a position with us coming to work, um, they are the best of the best. Uh, people with 20 years experience. One psychiatrist we hired had 40 years, has 40 years of experience. He's retired. He came back from retirement to work um, uh, for us. But if we have more uh, uh, funding, we can increase our output and our service. And this is critical. And I'll just say one, one thing. You know, even if we get... Uh, more funding to treat one more person we're gonna it's gonna happen we're gonna do it and so this is critical i i don't know how to ask for money uh but uh, but clearly uh it's a key a key factor in our ability to respond yeah and i understand from um that actually it's about $1,800 per, um, uh, 
I forgot how to say it in uh, English now. I have it in, in per tipul. So in other words, for every um, person that we need to treat, it take it's about $1,800 for one session. Um, my computer is frozen. Is everybody's frozen or is it only me? Can you hear me? Okay, I, yeah, froze. You froze? Okay, I wasn't sure. Um, and um, I froze, but I'm back. <laughs> good. So what I was saying in case it got cut off is that I understand it's about $1,800 per session per patient. And so that's-, that's No, no, it's $1,800 per patient. Uh-huh. And it uh, and usually the treatment course is sixteen sessions. Okay. So eighteen hundred is a rough estimation of what it will cost to treat one patient. Of course, some patients need longer care. Other patients could do with a bit less, but that's that's the general estimate. Um, so yes. And again, um, if um, if people do want to contribute, um, we have the uh, the emergency the, the TAU emergency fund that is um, going to be um, collecting for this need, as well as uh, we shared Professor um, uh, uh, Yair's uh, <laughs> website, so that in case you are a professional and wants to utilize some of that, and of course, there's also an email address that was shared if you're interested, because we have, I, all of a sudden we have a bunch of volunteers who want to help out. And I'm, I'm really very touched by this because I, I see, you can see how widely the, the trauma um, is, is, is being expressed in many different communities, both in the US and Canada, um, uh, in Israel, of course. So I just want to, to express that, that, that that's just very beautiful that people want to want to contribute with their time. Um, and I hope that we'll be able to utilize some of their some of their help. We'll see, of course. Um, and for those who missed it in the beginning, um, Professor Bar Chaim did say that he will uh, respond uh, to to those inquiries if you if you uh, write in. So um, so I think that that's that's where we are. Um, I wonder if uh, we we leave it at that for right now. Um, do, is there anything else you want to say before I before I end it, um, uh, Professor Bar Chaim? Um, no, I think I think you understand the situation. I hope uh, you can understand the situation. It's a grave one. It's not a. I I could never imagine uh, something like this. Uh, in my lifetime, but if you can help, help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's 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 a really like you said. There's um very rare that um you, you do something in science that so quickly can translate into the real world and can be of use immediately. So um so I think we have to uh, be happy that uh, at least we have that, and um. And yeah, and I thank you so much for, for your, your work and for sitting with us today. Um, so I'm just going to um, also thank you all, all of our friends from around the world who have joined us. I know we couldn't get to everybody's questions. Hopefully we'll be able to review and respond to you individually if we have um, specific things that you're asking. Uh, in the chat window, somebody asked where was all this stuff listed. In the chat window is where you should find the email address and the website. Um, and uh, again, thank you uh, everyone for joining us and Professor Yair Bar Chaim for your work and for your time that you spent with us today and uh, sharing your expertise. Um, and uh, I hope that Am uh, Israel Chai is, I guess, what, what we can say. Am Israel Chai. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everyone.